free vet, Kati la, wandering ruski desu. So today I wanted to make a video that formulates a worldview or a framework on which nationalists should embrace when it comes to their approaches on foreign policy. Because when we think of nationalism, right, it, we always kind of think of it as a domestic-focused ideology that focuses on the nation and its internal affairs. And this makes sense, because the core of being a nationalist is putting the interests of your country and its people first. So you will always be kind of focused on just what matters for your country, not what happens outside of it. Uh, but a nationalist world, by its very nature uh, as well, uh, implies the existence of many other nation states that you'll have to live with. Because as I mentioned in my identitarianism video, every unique people group has a right to their own country and uh, for their own people. So thus, you know, in a nationalist world, there are going to be hundreds of different countries that you'll have to live with. And so a nationalist has to come to terms with how that nation should interact with these other nations. And this often gets ignored in nationalist circles. So what are the core principles that formulate this nationalist worldview that uh, nationalists should embrace when it comes to foreign policy? So the number one thing that you need to learn about is a term called sovereignty. The core idea that underlines all foreign relations in this nationalist vision is the idea of sovereignty. This is the main goal of any foreign policy, which is to secure and ensure your nation's survival and sovereignty as much as possible. So sovereignty carries the term sovereign, which in my mind means to be in control. To be sovereign in your affairs means that your country is in control of its own destiny. So basically any foreign policy you try to embark on has to have the core mission to be it has to be rooted in your nation's ability to chart its own course, to make its own rules, and to control the destiny of its future. Now, there's various levels of sovereignty, which I'm going to go over. The first level of sovereignty is what I call real sovereignty. And this is kind of like the traditional aspect of sovereignty, which means this is the level of control a nation has from direct control from an outside power. So basically, can you prevent a foreign army from just bulging into your, you know, invading, pillaging your cities, taking power, dictating what you have to do, uh, taking your stuff. I mean, if not, then you, you don't have sovereignty. You're, 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 you're conquered, conquered and vanquished people. And this is actually probably perhaps the main reason why states were created in the first place. Because since the dawn of time, the various you know different groups of the human race, they had resources, they had land, they had wealth, and those who had a lot of it were subject to attack and subjugation. And thus, you needed to develop a state to protect this land, this your, uh, you know, your resources and such. So basically, you had to make a state to protect it from invading armies. So basically, the key of international relations is that we develop a system where other nations can can't just barge in and take what we have and subject subjugate us. We must remain fully sovereign within our nation. The second layer of sovereignty is what I call resilient sovereignty. Uh, this basically means the degree of which you are forced from an outside power to change what is in your national interest. So the first level of sovereignty is one of hard power. The second one is soft power. For example, if you want to ban homosexual relations in your country to promote traditional values, can the other country exploit your economic, financial, and other ties abroad to force your hand to change your mind? So let's say you wanted to do something, but because... And while they didn't force you, they kind of twist your hand to force you to do something else. If they can do that, then you don't have resilient sovereignty. To have that, a state must be able to continue doing what it needs to do despite sanctions, blockades, and so forth. Basically, how tangled is your nation in the chaotic jungle of the international? Do you find yourself entangled in entangled alliances that compel you to spend blood and treasure abroad, even if it's not in your best interests? Are foreign powers buying up large parts of your land and, and a... Um, you know, large parts of your land and resources. Now, many people focus merely on preventing a hard suppression of a nation's sovereignty through direct control, but it is also important to resist soft suppression. You know, you don't need a foreign army in your capital to lose your sovereignty. You may also lose it by other powers using sanctions, international bodies, and various others' pressures to force you to change course. Now, the last type of sovereignty that you need to secure is what I call full sovereignty. Basically, a, a thought experiment I have is, if what if all nations in the world got sunk into the ocean? Can your nation still be able to survive more or less without a complete breakdown in your society? If not, then you have to become so interconnected and tied into the international that the events from the outside world, beyond your control, as, you know, as beyond the control that you have, could affect what you have to do. Now, you know, obviously, we're in, you know, we're in some ways we're interconnected. So even if, if all the nations collapsed, it would affect you somewhat. But you need to be able to re lower that as much as possible. 
you know, you don't want to have your country be just completely wiped out and destroyed because of an event some far away. You know, if, if the Chinese stock market collapses, we shouldn't – the American stock market should collapse. If Russia stops giving oil – like energy to Germany, Germany should still be able to create energy. If – in the opposite sense, if, if America sanctions Russia with semiconductors, Russia should still be able to control its semiconductor industry. Uh, so basically, the main goal in foreign affairs is to secure as much sovereignty as we can for our nation. This is the basis for any relations within the international sphere. This is why I talk so much about it, because this is the core of it. Uh, you know, the, any sort of foreign relations will come from a respect and understanding of other nations' sovereignty and for your own. Basically, this is how we would find kind of relative peace, because if we respect each other's boundaries and borders, then we could trade, negotiate, work with each other, and such. One of the greatest evils in modernity is this drive of globalism that seeks to destroy all the unique nations and peoples, and basically for a small elite to rule a singular slave class with tyrannical force. Globalism must be crushed. The main aim should be the Westphalian tradition of sovereign nation-states that represent the vast unique peoples of the world who can cooperate but are sovereign over their own affairs. So how do you have sovereignty? How do you actually enforce it? Well, there's two points to that. First, the first policy in, in terms of securing your sovereignty as nationals is to have a strong, rational defense. Now, to be clear, does this not mean a military-run society or a military that is so bloated that it wants to invade other countries to feel itself useful? What it does mean is that if, we, if some other nation does not respect our sovereignty, we have the ability to maintain it by force. It is only that kind of threat of force that, hey, if you try to stop – if you try to take what we want and force us, we could actually deflect what you – you know, force – stop you from trying to enforce your will and actually secure our sovereign. Now, we, because we could talk about how sovereign we are or how we want things to go our way, but this can never be done without a sense of a strong force that can back us up. So, thus, a strong and well-equipped military with a martial people who can take up arms in defense when needed is a key part of securing our sovereignty. But what you do not want is a militarized society. The military is great, but you do not want the military to take over your society and become what your society is about. A, you, know, you don't want a military that captures your government. But you do want a strong enough military to assert your sovereignty claims and be able to put the weight, put weight to your words on the international sphere, so that other nations cannot just push you around and take what they want. The second part that you need as nationalists in securing your sovereignty, uh, it you need a a elegant and agile diplomatic corps that can manage relations peacefully with other nations. Ideally, the military would be a just in case tool, something that you would ideally never have to really use. Unlike what most people think, nationalists do not like war. We don't want to force our will on other people. Force should only be used to protect your country and never to force other nations to bow to your whim because then you are violating other people's sovereignty. In the majority of cases, you will be talking with other nations through the diplomatic route, and thus what you need is a strong diplomatic core, which is needed to spread your goals, to secure deals, to flatten out points of contention, because I believe that most nations are willing to come to the table and negotiate. Ideally, you want to secure your deals that are in relation to strengthen your country or something that benefits both countries. But you must also realize that this rubs up against what other nations might want sometimes. The goal is to, so basically, the goal in the diplomatic sphere in, the nation, in, in securing your sovereignty is to get as much as you want. It's something that enhances you. Hopefully, it might, maybe it could enhance the other nation. As it could be a good for both sides. But the goal is, is that. But if that cannot be possible, then there must be some compromises, something that you know, that could try that we kind of get a little bit of what we mostly want. Um, and basically, in order to find that compromise, you need a strong diplomatic core. Because when that balance is struck by a strong diplomatic core, you can basically have a, you can deal with other nations in a peaceful, productive, and fruitful manner. One thing that we need to add when we're talking about a nationalist approach to foreign policy is that we should avoid the forever and pointless wars. That, that is of an essential part. Nationalists do not want to just conquer other people just because they can. You know, again, wars are just to secure our existence, not to force our way of life on others or conquer other peoples because our nationals worldview, because our nationals worldview by its, by its very nature necessitates a wide amount of independent nation states. Otherwise, we are no different than the globalists who want to erase all the nations into a single mongrel stew. Thus, we should not go out for, you know, trying to look for monsters to slay, as George Washington said. You know, we have to give the military control, you know, we, we shouldn't give military control of our foreign policy totally, because 
every every nail they see in foreign policy can be solved with a hammer of force because the only thing the military thinks of is war. Thus, it, you know, you don't want to have the military being in control of everything and p dragging your country into war, um, which is why you only have it for, as a self-defense tool. Um, another point is that you don't want to entangle yourself in alliances or treaties that um, that harm you, that does don't help you. Um, you can make friends, you can side trade agreements and so forth. You know, that's, you know, you're going to have to do trade deals. You have to do peace, you know, treaties that kind of establish the borders and such, uh, customs, you know, there's a lot of rules, but, um, you know, like you don't want to entangle yourself so much that, you know, you then have to be forced to comply with an international body that goes against your interest, uh, without you being consulted about it first. Alrighty, so now that we have established that securing sovereignty is the main goal of any foreign policy, and then going about, and then we went over the various other ways we can approach and actually back up that sovereignty, we now must come to terms that we do not live in like a new era, meaning we didn't just uh, pop out of nowhere. We are entering a world that has tens of thousands of years of history, and thus we have to take this theoretical approach uh, that we have, you know, what we have in theory versus how does it apply in practice. So in theory, every nation state would have clear, defined, and understood borders that they are sovereign over, and everyone respects those borders. But this is not how the real world operates. So how should we approach different states who have different claims of control over certain pieces of land? Because, you know, there's been these disputes for tens of thousands of years. We obviously, not all the current borders are like, hey, you know, a lot of people have like, hey, actually, this land is ours, and so forth. The current borders of the world are not perfect, especially not to everyone. You know, so when approaching these issues, there's a few things to keep in mind. The first is that what are the actual people who live in this piece of disputed land? Again, we have to go back to nationalist theory or, you know, identitarianism. A nation is simply a home for an ethnic group. If that same ethnic group is the majority in that piece of land, but it is controlled by another country with a different people group, uh, then the moral decision of a nationalist is that is that to have that, that piece of land has to be transferred to the country whose ethnic makeup is the same as that land. Um, so basically just like, you know, um, if, you're, if, if a disputed piece of land has majority, has a ethnic group that is majority for one country, then that, that should go to their, um, that uh, country, not to the country that is different ethnically, linguistically, culturally, etc. Um, so let's make it a bit more complicated. There's a, a little bit more complicated issue at hand is how do you define a people group? Some people have different interpretations. Should Germans and Austrians combine to become one nation of Germans or do they deserve to be separate nations? You know, or should Ukrainians and Russians come together to be a part of an all Russian state? Some people agree in merging and others think they are different enough to justify a different state. How do you reconcile the two? From a nationalist point of view, when you deal with these issues, it should be at the hands of the people. If both the Germans and the Austrians feel themselves the same, then they should be able to merge peacefully. But if the majority does not want to merge, then they should remain as, as, a separate, as separate entities. Again, it all comes back to making sure the unique peoples of the world are able to self-govern and have sovereignty over their own affairs. And it is that understanding that can guide us in settling disputes over where the borders are. In a nationalist world, we, should, we would ideally have world peace, because if everyone holds this ideal of sovereignty, then people would respect each other's borders and right to self-rule without feeling the need to conquer or force their way of life on them. We would cooperate, negotiate, and trade and work with each other with an understanding of each country's right to rule themselves. So basically, it's uh, kind of, you know, the, you could use nationalist theory to still apply it to these real-world practical disputes. Um, but again, you know, these are contentious issues. But again, we could, if you just kind of apply these ideas of like, you know, do people agree or not? Do, um, you know, do people agree or do they, uh, do they disagree or do they think of themselves separate? You know, you have to, you have to kind of feel the situation. Maybe back in the day, Germans and Austrians would have loved to join together in one state, but now it doesn't, that's not the case. Um, so that, you know, you just have to kind of feel the situation out. So one last thing that needs to be addressed is how do you deal with nations that do not abide by the nationalist principle? So we kind of were talking about what if every nation abide by these nationalist principles before? You know, but what if they don't follow the same framework? You know, things like communist regimes, fascist expansionist ones like the Nazi regime, or global liberal ones that want to turn you all into a mongrel goo. 
you know, you cannot use the same principles to work out a settlement that I used before. The first thing that needs to be addressed is if the other state's different ideology can allow for your state to exist. Perhaps the state is based on a religious or a socialist one, right? So if they don't want to forcibly convert your state to their religious state, like say we want to convert, we're, we're going to annex you and convert you to our caliphate or, or something, right? Or if you're, you know, they don't want to expand their workers' revolution to your state, uh, then basically you would deal with these states um, the same way you would work with other, any other country or state. Because again, it's, it's just about do you threaten us or not? Um, you can still trade, work, and cooperate with them. There is no need to be hostile if another state does not bother you and the existence of your people. But what if they do? What if you're Poland in the 1930s and Germany wants to annex you? Or if you're Israel uh, when Arabs want to annihilate you? Then if there's no way to rec – there's these different worldviews, and only one worldview can exist at the, at the same time. Uh, that means the only way you deal with that is the strong military power that you have built up and kept in reserve, and that's when that comes in. You use it to crush and eradicate any threat that tries to conquer your country – or forced into a different state of affairs that isn't based on your people being able to self-govern and govern their own destinies. Uh, so basically, like other states can exist that aren't nationalist, but as long as they don't threaten you, then it shouldn't be a problem. If it is a problem, then well, you destroy them. So this is the framework that we should focus that we should conduct our foreign affairs from a nationalist point of view. We will, as nationalists, be surrounded by other countries by virtue of our ideology. The key to any nationalist international order is one that is rooted in the respect of sovereignty for each country and, to, sec and to secure their own destinies. This can be done with a strong national defense that still refrains from pointless war and a strong diplomatic corps for negotiation and creating trade and cooperation without entangling us in international groups and control. We also talked about how to smooth out conflicts over territory within a nationalist framework and how to confront nations that don't follow the nationalist framework. With that being said, I have you... I hope you enjoyed the video, and make sure to subscribe and like the video. So aim high, wander on, from America, with Russian love.